why should we be very careful to make a proper distinction between law and gospel? Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Larson, the visiting pastor, the visitation pastor, now doing back, uh, back to doing visiting among the sick and shut in and others at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And we welcome you to this Bible study. We welcome you to the Bible study and we invite you to our worship services at 8.30 or 10.30. You can find us at the corner of Swinton and Lake Ida, 400 North Swinton and Delray Beach. So we welcome you. We're studying Paul's letter to the Galatians. Well, where's that? That's, uh, that's in Turkey. But that's 2000 years ago when it was not Turkey. It was a collection of provinces of the Roman Empire. So this is just an introduction. We're not going to do a verse by verse study. I hope you're not disappointed with that, but it would take us oh, months to do it at that level. And we're doing a lot of study about law and gospel. The main theme of the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, since Christ died in my place to earn complete forgiveness, there is nothing I can add. And anyone who adds anything to the free grace of Christ makes that grace, for themselves at least, incomplete and not free. Of course, you cannot negate the grace, the grace of Christ. It's given, but you can refuse to re receive it, refuse to apply it to your life, and you can refuse to apply it to the lives of others. And that's a great tragedy when you withhold the grace of Christ. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. The central thought, the gospel, underlined twice. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And there is no other gospel, says St. Paul in chapter 1. And that gospel has no requirements that we do good deeds of the law in order to merit forgiveness or obtain salvation. Maybe if I'm good enough, say some people, then God will be gracious to me. But I'm not good enough, so perhaps he's not gracious. Well, that is a terrible way to think about the law, which is accusing the conscience or the conscience, which is accusing the sinner. You cannot do anything to merit God's love. He just loves you. That's what I want to say right at the top. God's love never ends. Never ends. And he's got you in his arms to save you in all the meaning, in all the meanings of that word save. Well, I've forgot to add a prayer request. Uh, my, our daughter-in-law's mother is severely ill in the hospital, and they have not figured out what's wrong with her. So I, I'll ask you to pray. She's on the list, but it's just become more difficult for her. Pardon my interruption, but I just remembered, and I didn't talk about her in our prayer requests. Thank you for uh, that. That's why the letter of Paul to the Galatians is important to us today. Paul's letter to the Galatians sharply distinguishes. It separates. It makes the difference between law and gospel very clear and plain. I don't want you to take that for granted and say, well, I know the difference. Well, you probably do, but it is in the application of law and gospel to our lives and to the lives of others that we run into difficulties or find ourselves confused. I don't want you to be confused. Well, we're making applications. And here is a little chart that I have uh, put up to distinguish between the law and the gospel. They are different colors. The law is in black. It's like death. And the gospel in brilliant gold that leads to life. I want you to understand some differences, and I'm going to list four. The law makes demands. Do you agree with that? 
The law yeah. makes demands. What kind of demands does the law make? That we follow the Ten Commandments. That's right. Uh, right. That we did. That we um, did uh, clean sacrifices. All right. Here's that, a summary. Go ahead. Who was speaking? Oh, I was to say the clean sacrifices were were for forgiveness of sins, basically. What? Correct. Yes. They were to prefigure the. The yes, sacrifice of Christ. Christ. Yes. Christ. Yes. Here's a summary. The demand uh, of the law is what God says. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Well, no one can measure up to that. The holiness of God. That's the demand that the law makes, and no one can fulfill the law. No one, except one who did. So that points to the gospel. The gospel makes no demands. I uh, remember what happened in a seminary about 45 years ago. 45 years ago, a student on the way to class gave some money or food to a homeless man. And when he came into class and they were talking about law and gospel, the student was um, a little bit proud or happy that he had done that. And he said to the professor, now that was doing the gospel, wasn't it? Oh, such a terrible mistake. The professor laid into him and said, there is no way you can do the gospel. The gospel is done. The gospel doesn't make any demands of us. Now, some of you are going to say, well, doesn't the gospel lead us to love one another? Well, yes, the gospel is the motivation. And it does lead us, but it doesn't demand that we love others. That's what the law does. The gospel makes no demands. Now, here's a second difference as we distinguish the clear difference between the law and the gospel. The law accuses. Let's see if I can do this. Yep, see, the law is a, is a finger that's pointing. In the, in the courtroom scene, when the witness who has witnessed the crime is asked by the prosecuting attorney, do you know who committed that murder and you know what the witness does he points to the man sitting in the defense uh, at the defense's table and he says that man or that woman he she pulled the trigger see that's the accusation the accusation the law always accuses Maybe not some dreadful thing such as murder, but the law accuses us of every infraction that we ever commit. It is complete and comprehensive. It's more than the Ten Commandments. It's all the applications of the Ten Commandments that occur in the New Testament, in the imperative verbs of Jesus and the apostles. The law accuses. You got that? What does the gospel do? Does the gospel accuse? Oh, no, no, no. The gospel forgives. Yes. The gospel takes away the accusation. The gospel absolves. You understand. When a pastor or another Christian say to you, that's all right. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the way you preach the gospel. The gospel forgives for the sake of Christ. It's not okay. When the law accuses, we never say, well, that's okay. <laughs> it shouldn't anyway. The gospel forgives. Now let's go on to a, a third distinction between the law and the gospel. If I teach nothing else in this session today, uh, this is the most important. The third uh, distinction between the law and the gospel is that the law doesn't excuse sin. 
you may think you excuse sin when you say, well, we're all sinners. That is a statement of fact, but it doesn't excuse sin. I know that some of you were in, in the class years ago when someone said, well, that's our human nature. And I, I hope was in a kindly way <laughs> said, well, no, it's not our human nature. It's our sinful human nature. And you remember that correction I made because that stems from Genesis 3. All right. From the original sin which we inherit. But the law doesn't excuse sin on the basis of that, on the basis of the fact that, well, we inherited it so we can't help it. No, no, the law doesn't soft pedal the accusation. It, it doesn't excuse sin. The gospel never excuses sin. To forgive is not to make an excuse. I think uh, young children think that is true. <laughs> well, I couldn't help it. The cookies were right there on the counter and they smelled so good that I thought you wouldn't mind if I took a few and ate them. No, the gospel doesn't excuse sin then we would be back under the law if we took what we were not supposed to have. Now, when we become adults, we have tons and tons and dozens and dozens of health requirements that we have learned. Would you like to list a few hundred? <laughs> and sometimes we go off our diet and we take or eat or do what the doctor has said, no, you're going to pay the penalty for that. There's no excuse there. It's you're going to suffer the consequences because then you're back under the law. I think I'm making the distinction clear that the gospel never excuses sin. It forgives sin. And the fourth difference, and this one you know very well, the law shows us our sin. It's yeah. like a like a mirror, remember? Yep. I the curb mirror guide. Right. So uh, that's what we have before us is the, the mirror of the law to show us our sin. And what does the gospel do? That has been for us. Yes. The God, what does the gospel show us? Um, we are by, by grace. We okay. are. No, oh, thank you, Pastor. Um, anybody, shows, what does the gospel show us? Well, it shows us how to uh, express, um, how to ask for forgiveness. It shows us our Savior. Yes. There you go. Right. <laughs> and that's, Judy, you're right. That, that the basis of our forgiveness is in Jesus Christ alone. Confess our sins is the word I'm looking for. All right. So you see the sharp distinction. The PowerPoint doesn't allow me to easily draw a line, a big, thick division between law and gospel. At least I don't know how to do it. So you know the difference between law and gospel. When you get these uh, uh, slides, uh, you might want to print out this, this one thing and, or put it someplace uh, where you can see it again. Okay. It's important. Now, uh, let's look at the scriptures. We haven't looked much at the Bible yet today. I want someone, um, Judy, I'm going to uh, change and, uh, and not ask for you to read first. I'll ask Jamie if you're up to read Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, you know it almost by heart. Yes. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. Thank you. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were studying Galatians, and here you're quoting from Ephesians. Uh, another city in that province of Galatia. But uh, 
this was a separate letter or by grace, not a result of works. But I want you to see how Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, teaches the same thing as Galatians. Now, Judy, would you read? Okay, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but, but, but through the faith. We know that a person is not justified by work of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Doesn't this uh, say the same thing? Mm -hmm. Not a result of works through faith? Mm -hmm. Through faith? Right. Through faith? You finally get it if you keep on reading it because by works of the law no one will be justified no one will be justified by works and this is a constant teaching of scripture it's not just in these two letters you will never find jesus or anyone else by speaking by authority of their apostleship or by authority of being a prophet of the Lord in the Old Testament, you will find them saying the same thing. We could quote dozens of passages. And if you look up your cross references, you're going to find a few of them. So this is important, and it's the core of the, of the Christian teaching. So here's my question of you. How do these verses from Ephesians uh from Ephesians 2 and Galatians 2, how do they apply to you? Let's talk about application. We can never do enough to be saved. Right. We can never do enough good works. Right. And or in, in Galatians. Yes, in the, in the book of Galatians, how do these verses apply to us? And, it, and it's only through our faith in Jesus Christ that we will receive forgiveness and eternal life. Um, there's no other way. He's the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, but through me. But through me. Okay. Okay. One of Luther's quotes was, the law shows us our sin and the wrath of God. The gospel shows us our Savior and the grace of God. That's a good quote. Mm -hmm. Though you spend your life doing all kinds of hundreds and thousands of works of the law, and you should, it won't justify you in the sight of God. It seems like that ought to be true, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. And that's why it's such a universal teaching of those who have not been taught by Christ and taught about him and his life and why he lived and why he died. When we study the Gospels, we see what has been done and it's finished. This is sometimes hard for us to... Uh, make application to our own hearts and we're going to talk about that and it's one of the main themes of the bible as i've just said by grace alone through faith alone because of christ alone sola gratia sola fides sola christus i might not have the endings correct on my solas i learned latin a long time ago when i had forgotten the proper endings. I think they're supposed to agree with the noun. But you know in English, and that's all you have to know about these three solas. It is not just Lutherans, by the way, who celebrate these solas. Did you know that? Hmm. The people of the evangelical grouping, whatever that is, who make no denominational uh, adherence, they will celebrate Martin Luther's teaching by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. They will join with us in, in saying these. 
whether in Latin or English or any other language of the world. If, if, if people who have never heard of Martin Luther studied the Bible, they would still come up with these, mm -hmm. these three solas. Hmm. Because it is so evident as you study the New Testament, especially the New Testament. I want you to know that. Now, there are differences in the denominations, serious differences. We're not talking about those today like we did when we studied the doctrine <coughs> of the Lord's Supper. So here's some more application. You're going to work your heads a little bit. All right. Let's suppose a friend confesses some wrong to you, you know, in private, and is worried that God doesn't forgive. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Do you apply law or gospel? Gospel. 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 I would say gospel, yes. What if you apply law? Just condemning that person and, and they cannot then atone for the, they can't pray to be forgiven. And then if they're not forgiven, then they will continue to blame themselves and then they won't have yeah. God's grace. Um, we're having a little trouble with your audio. I can hear the words, but they're distorted. Okay, I don't know if you oh. can fix that or not. But uh, I don't know if I can or not. Oh, you ah, did it yes. well. That's that's fine. Oh, I just got a little closer to the mic. <laughs> okay. Okay. If, if you apply law, you crush the sinner. But what did you say? You what are the sinner? You crush them. You crush them. You 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 put them in a situation where they're in a worse state because oh. they went to you for help and let me give a, a medical example a couple of nurses here will understand this so you go to a patient who is hurting and instead of giving an, a piece some medicine that they're crying out for um you um oh, i don't want to say something really awful uh, but you not only refuse the medicine, you give them something that makes the, the pain worse. Uh, you wouldn't do that in compassion. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. But when you give the, the law to someone who is already repentant and believing... You don't, you don't ask them why they did what they did. Well, you might... Uh, well, you're going to get a justification, which is either um, terribly wrong or not helpful. People try to justify their sin by explaining why they did it. Um, I'm not sure of your use of the word why. <laughs> that's a complicated uh, you See, That's thing. going to be a judgment call for, for God to make, probably. Right. I, I suppose, but here in the in analysis, when the person justifies their sin or tells you why, you might listen attentively and say, well, I understand that. I, I might have done the same thing because I, I too am a sinner. But I want you to know that God loves you and forgives you. And he doesn't want you to live with that worry. I want you to know about Christ who died for that sin, for that particular sin. And since God knows all, you can't mm -hmm. hide from him. He already knows it. Let's confess. It. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Who was speaking? No, I just said you can't lie to him because he knows. <laughs> you can't lie to God, you mean? Right. Yeah. So let's take another case. This is called casuistry because it takes up cases, huh? A close relative continues to sin against other members of the family, but refuses to change. Now, I don't want you to bring up something from your personal family. Uh, I mean, if you want to change the names, but, uh, you know, this is pretty public. It goes out on Zoom to anybody who wants to watch it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let's just say a, a hypothetical close relative continues to sin against other members of the family, but refuses to change. And this close relative comes to you. 
What do you apply, law or gospel? I would say probably law first. The law first, yes. You may hope to get to the gospel, but you don't know that yet. No. So why do you apply law? Well, I guess if you know the sin is, it's a, I guess you, you have to know what the sin is and if it's certainly wrong uh, and refuses to change. Yeah. We're you just taking... have to let the, you have to let them know, you know, might, it might be, it might be that they're, they're hurting. Uh, it might be against one of the 10 commandments that you can there be very sensitive about saying, or, you know, I guess what we know about the law and what God wants us to do, if it's not, if it's not honoring God's law, um, you listen it's, not easy. it's not easy and it's not easy to talk to family members <laughs> that's right but the key word in here is refuses and what yeah, does that point refuses. to what does this word point to a bible word uh stubborn yeah um i'm trying to think in the old testament what was it they were uh uh what, what, what is, they were they were uh hard-hearted hard-hearted this is uh, unrepentant or unrepentant yes. i'm not sorry they got what was coming to them <laughs> <laughs> well you, you've met people like that i hope not too many when they continue to sin and when they it is brought to their attention but they go back to doing the same thing there is money, uh, there are money problems in families. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes when there's a death in the family and the, the brothers and sisters gather together and you can, you can see what <laughs> comes out. Well, maybe we need an attorney at that point to settle. Just like in the Old Testament, they would bring their complaints before a judge. Mm -hmm. But the refusal to change I think the only thing you can do in a situation like that is to uh, pray for the person that um, they will come to find uh, a realization that what they're doing is wrong and can then change because people are very stubborn sometimes and even though you tell them what they're doing isn't right they don't see it that way so the only way you can really help them is to pray for them that's right and if you have the courage to apply the law, and you can do it in a kind way, mm -hmm. you don't have to shout and raise your fists. You can say, well, uh, if, I, if I hear you correctly, what you're doing is wrong. And see if you can point to it. You see that this is a difficult thing. It is easy to see the sharp distinction between law and gospel. <laughs> But you see why Luther said, if you can properly distinguish between law and gospel, I'll give you a doctor's hat. <laughs> I'll award you a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I find it hard in my own life. And this is Luther saying it's hard. Wow. And, you know, that's, it's hard. A, a third case, you are bothered in the night by something you did or said or failed to do long ago, do you apply law or gospel to yourself? I would say the gospel. Gospel. Yeah. The gospel. gospel. You are you are correct. And Carola, uh, why did you say gospel here? Why did I say the gospel? I thought that's what it is, Pastor. That's what it is. Only the gospel can soothe a, a hurting conscience. And you already have admitted that you failed to do long ago. So somewhere along the way, you've realized you did do something wrong. Uh -huh. So you, um, you know, that that has been corrected by, I guess, the law or whatever, to, to know that it was wrong and it wasn't the right thing. 
All right. Yeah. See, thank you, Judy. This is uh, the key word is you're bothered. That means uh, your conscience has accused you already. Mm -hmm. You stand in the, you stand at the, at the defendant's table and you, and you hear the accusation of the prosecuting attorney. Well, and I, I think this is very true of, you know, as we all enter Bible study at no matter what age in our life, because it's, you know, I'll admit there's a lot of things I don't know about the Bible yet today, but I certainly didn't know. But until I learned what God was really trying to tell me and teach me and, you know, and you learn more expounding on how to apply it, um, you sometimes do do things that you don't realize are wrong until you move along in your life and suddenly you find out they weren't the right things or the way to handle something. Um, and then, you know, I think that that failure to do, uh, to do it long ago, you realized it. And so now you do want to correct it and uh, make it, I think, make it right maybe with somebody or make it right with yourself, uh, knowing that okay. you are forgiven. Yeah, you're talking in case of, of, of if there's a possible restitution or right. a, a going to a person saying, I, I, I sinned against you and I'm asking for your forgiveness. Okay. That's a horizontal relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, but here we're talking about the vertical relationship, I suppose. Uh, but I think you're right to bring up that going to the person against whom you have sinned. And you find that in the New Testament all right and the gospel is there in first john uh, chapter one if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness from all of it if you know the gospel sentences i know you know the john three sixteen sentence mm -hmm. But learn the scripture sentences that proclaim gospel without any admixture of law. Mm -hmm. He is mm -hmm. faithful and just to forgive your sins. By grace. Well, how, can you for, how can you be any more clear than that? Mm -hmm. So I want you to learn the gospel so that you can make application to yourself anytime, anyplace. All right. Let me give one more uh, application, one more case. A church member, a sincere con Christian, is found to have committed a sin for which the person will be charged as a criminal. And you happen to know that person and you're in conversation with that church member. This is not just you learned it by the grapevine. You are having coffee or lunch or some other situation. And what do you say? This is harder than the other three. Well, unfortunately, we're bound by the laws of the of where we live. And even though it is a sin and you can ask for forgiveness and be granted God's grace, you still under the law of where you live have to be charged as a criminal and face the the music music. There you go. Yeah, the consequences. <laughs> consequences. Uh, you have it right. You you have it exactly right. And and you made a distinction between the kingdom on the right and the kingdom on the left. Now, when this church member comes to you, it is really not anymore about the kingdom on the left, the, the state. The word state is used in, in when we're talking about this doctrine to mean any form of government, all right? State, federal, uh, municipality, or, uh, or any other government. So that's already happened. Now, what you didn't know is why this church member, this Christian is coming to you. Mm. Are they asking, how can I be forgiven? I think in society, we have a trouble. We have trouble looking at those who are housed in our penitentiaries or jails. 
of realizing that they are sinners in need of law and gospel. Uh, chaplains who know what they are doing apply law and gospel in the proper order to the at the right time to uh, criminals who have been convicted and some of them come to faith and repent well they're still going to serve their time i know of one who enrolled in a bible study online before it was online when it was still a thing called correspondence <laughs> and uh, i don't know he maybe got a certificate of some kind but in the process he began to teach a bible study in the jail god used evil for good mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. he took great delight and i think he has been released he has served his time, and I haven't caught up with him for several years now. But um, God had his way with him, where he repented and believed he was a forgiven sinner and served his time. Well, speaking of time, I've spent too much on this. No, I want you to see that these are real cases that apply the law and gospel is not simply a doctrine hidden away in the book of Galatians for some people to discover, and then they will be called theologians. You are always an amateur theologian, learning and also applying. As a parent, as a member of a congregation, as a friend to someone in your community, you are doing the work of the Lord, and you get a chance to be on the front lines and meet people that your pastors and teachers will never see. And I want you to remember the gospel sentences that you're going to need when you apply that. Okay. You might have to go to work on it and, and memorize <laughs> in your life or in the lives of others, you are treating of sin and grace. And your treating of sin and grace is like a physician. And you apply the proper medicine at the right time to the right person. You apply law or gospel. And it takes that sensitivity to listen to where they are, to know which one to apply. If you apply gospel to a person who is not repentant, they will probably for a long time stay in that state of unrepentance. Because what they need is the mirror of the law. But you give them Jesus. Well, you haven't given them the right medicine. On the other hand, if someone is crushed by the law and you give them more law, no life comes. They stay in their despair. There are many terrible consequences to not applying the proper medicine in the right in each case you who have practiced medicine as a nurse you understand that it's critical it's critical their life depends upon it so are you treating a hardened sinner i did nothing wrong self-justification or are you treating a repentant but fearful sinner? Listen long enough to know. And it may take more than one or two times of listening. I think you know from the medicine world, whether you've been a professional in, in medicine or not, that the most critical thing, uh, the, the most important instrument that you have is not your stethoscope, it is not the blood pressure uh, cuff or the thermometer. It's your ears. You want to be treated by a doctor who listens to your complaint. If he doesn't listen, if she doesn't listen, how can they know what medicine to apply? And you probably could tell me cases where 
the wrong medicine was applied because mm. the 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 professional was not professional and assumed. I don't want to bring up cases. Or some other spiritual illness. Mm -hmm. It, it is, um, is something that we practice with a little bit of uh, trepidation and uh, I try to remember to pray before I go into a situation if I can and I'm asking God's help because I don't know what I'm going to meet and that's something that we can all do isn't it God loves to hear us pray no other book of the Bible beside the book of Galatians makes the pure grace of God so clear and forceful. I know I switched gears on you rather abruptly, but I want to talk about Galatians again. In 1526, Martin Luther wrote a commentary on the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, and he came back to that letter about nine years later, 1535, and wrote another commentary. Actually, he lectured he lectured and uh, people took notes and they transcribed them and they put them into the German language and it got typeset over on Gutenberg's invention and it got produced and circulated all over Germany and part of Europe. And uh, the letter to the Galatians is the one that made a great difference in the life of, of uh, Martin Luther and in the life of many, many others. I have a copy of the 1535 commentary. Um, I was looking at it this morning. And uh, here's what he says. It is because, as I often warn you, there is a clear and present danger that the devil may take away from us the pure doctrine of faith and may substitute it may substitute for it the doctrines of works in human traditions. It is very necessary, therefore, that this doctrine of faith be continually read and heard in public. No matter how well known it is, it still needs to be proclaimed. 500 years later, that's still true. The book of Galatians, the Lord meant for our hearing and understanding. And it's probably true that most of the people who sit in the pews on Sunday morning have either not read it or have not read it very recently and have difficulty understanding it. It is complex, and yet there are these simple ideas that we're talking about today. Martin Luther loved this letter because it was so close to his heart. Why? Because he faced a similar battle in the 16th century, his own time. And he wrote the epistle to the Galatians is my own little epistle. I have betrothed myself to it. It is my Catherine of Bora, my Katie, his wife. I wonder what Katie thought about that. Katie. Yeah, <laughs> um, he, he, he loved this letter because it was so pertinent to the fight against the teaching of law and works. Mm -hmm. The core of the Reformation is in the book of Galatians. That's how important it was to Martin Luther. We're not going to talk about Martin Luther all day. No, I just wanted you to see why he wrote this commentary about St. Paul's letter. And there, that is where St. Paul plainly re reveals heresy of adding law requirements to the gospel. Adding law requirements to the gospel. Now, what is a heresy? We better clear that word up, make sure everybody understands. What is a heresy? Tell us. A, fa a false teaching. A false teaching. Good. False according to what? Law. According to law. 
it's 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 a false teaching according to what standard oh yeah requirements according to what uh, I don't want to give it away in my question. Mm -hmm. What is the standard by which all teachings and all teachers shall be judged? A religious law. Yeah. You commandments. Mean, pardon? When they break the commandments, it's a heresy because they're breaking religion. Yeah. Well, what is a heresy? What does that word mean? Somebody's probably jumping on their phone to look it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's 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 false according to what standard? According to God? No. What is our standard by which we judge all teachers and teachings? The teachings of Jesus, the Bible? The Bible. Is our standard oh, that's yeah. not going away so a heresy is something contrary to the scriptures whether it's public or private okay mm -hmm. all right the christian sounding heresy of adding law requirements to the gospel comes up in every age it was a heresy before the reformation and it is a heresy today and it is it does come up and it is what the devil wants to do his trick is to subtract from the gospel by adding man-made requirements subtract by adding that won't work in math class but that's the devil's trick if he convinces you or me that the man-made requirements must be done in order for me to be forgiven, for me to be justified, for me to receive the gift of heaven. By adding those, he is subtracting from the gospel because it says that Christ did not do enough, that it wasn't finished. He's, I must add. He must, he's turning them into works. We have to do works. That's right. Man-made requirements or even God's requirements in the law. If I add law to gospel, I take away from the gospel. Because the gospel, listen to this, the gospel contains no law. I was going to say, it's, it's basically God's grace. It's God's grace. It's a gift to forgive. A gift, a free gift. Do you know the name of that heresy? The heresy of adding law requirements to the gospel? What's the name of that heresy? Thou oh, shall have no other gods before me. That's not the name of the heresy. Not the heresy. That's, that's okay. a quote from that's the, the Bible. Command. What's the name of the heresy of adding law to the gospel? I don't think you know this. Or when I tell you, you're going to say, oh, yeah. Because you've heard it before, but it uh, is not a, people don't talk about it a lot. Grace. Pardon? By faith. By faith, by long. By faith, by what's, what's the name of the heresy? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. nobody wins. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the heresy is legalism. Oh. Legalism. Legalism invades the church all the time. Legalism. So what's legalism? Well, I've answered it already by saying, adding law <laughs> to the gospel. Uh, yeah. So if I say, what is legalism? I will answer it. You must obey the law in order to be saved. Or you believe the gospel, but you still have to, add the law in order to be saved or legalism is also defined as adding man-made laws to the moral law of god such as you must kneel for confession i don't no one would do that that's almost silly 
But if I say that I must say three Hail Marys, that's adding a man-made law to the moral law of God because God never said we ought to do that. I hope I'm not treading on any feet, but if I tread on your feet, it may be because your feet need to be hurt. I don't know if you'll follow that. Don't get caught up in that, but this is legalism. <laughs> and the trouble with this heresy is it sounds very biblical because anyone can quote any number of passages that tell us we have to obey the law of God. And I'll say, well, of course you do. But not in order to be saved by grace alone. The heresy of justification by the law comes up during the history of the church. The Galatian letter crushes this heresy with an unqualified condemnation once and for all. You can't read this six chapter book without coming to the conclusion that it's wrong to add law to the gospel. True, we do need to hear the serious words of accusation and condemnation which come from God to us in his law. I think you'll agree with that. We need to hear them. When the law is not taught, we have no need for a savior and we have nothing of which to repent. And we need the proclamation of the gospel to believe what Christ has done for this for us. If we don't ever hear the gospel, we will despair. We will either fall into the error of self-righteousness or we will despair and do things uh, to try to uh, amend and solve our own sin problem. Good news. So here's some things, uh, the, the do's and the don'ts. Don't let the law destroy the gospel in your own life and in the lives of people that you deal with. Don't mix law and gospel. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is a complex thing. And in order to understand that, I would have to refer you to a, a book called The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel that I mentioned before by Dr. C.F.W. Walther. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse law and gospel. I would refer you to that same book. Hmm. And he goes into chapters and chapters. They are lectures. He goes into several lectures on these last two. Mixing law and gospel and confusing law and gospel. I want you to know that when a man goes to the seminary and he proposes to become a pastor, in one of his courses, or maybe more than one, the proper distinction between law and gospel, that book by uh, Dr. Walther, is required reading. Oh, my gosh. It's 400 pages long. Thanks. And we, oh. have, we had an exam just on that book. Okay. I thought I knew it. <laughs> oh, just, that's a lot of information to cover in an exam. <laughs> well, if you... If you had my copy of that book, that old black covered book, uh, you would find a lot of highlighting and underlining. <laughs> uh, a lot of notes in the margin. Now I have a reader's edition to that book and uh, I have tabs uh, that I have attached to the, <laughs> to the uh, pages in order to go back to some precious it's a wonderful book, and it helps you understand how to interpret the scriptures on the basis of law and gospel. Uh, I, I would love to teach a course on it, but it would be <laughs> it would be long. Remember, there were over uh, twenty six lectures of, uh, of about ninety minutes each uh, that Dr. Walther taught. Yeah. Oh, and <laughs> because if you don't know this, you're going to make a mess of your teaching and a mess of people's lives. It's like a, a physician going through 
medical school and, and, and having the professor say, now, what you're going to learn in this course is more valuable than any of your other courses. By this, you will keep people alive and you will not kill them. <laughs> the law kills. And the gospel makes alive. You see how important this is? It is one of the most important things I can say to you. The distinction between the law and the gospel is a pure and clear light by which you can interpret the Bible. And I want to go to, to uh, Dr. Martin Luther's uh, words, which were reused and reformed now oh, in about 1577, after he had been dead a couple of decades, 46, uh, no, that's 30 years later, there was, a, there was a problem in the church over law and gospel. I told you it was difficult. And, and so they said, well, let's write a part of our confession of what is true to clear this controversy up. And it's in the thing called uh, the solid declaration of the formula of Concord. You don't have to know that, but they used many, many words to talk about this. You know, theologians, uh, why use 10 words when a thousand will do? <laughs> but they wanted to clear it up. So they began to write. And here's what they wrote. As the distinction between the law and the gospel is a special, brilliant light, which serves to the end that God's word may be rightly divided, and the scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles may be properly explained and understood, we must guard it with especial care, in order that these two doctrines may not be mingled with one another, or a law be made out of the gospel, whereby the merit of Christ is obscured and troubled consciences are robbed of their comfort, which they otherwise have in the holy gospel when it is preached genuinely and in its purity. Mm. That's only part of a paragraph at the beginning of that part of our Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord. You can look up the whole thing. I've told you before where to find it, bookofconcord.org. Mm -hmm. There you will find a, a, a page on uh, through which you can navigate to the formula of Concord, and you can read it. Read it slowly and carefully. It's, it's in English. You don't have to read the German or the Latin. See, this is for you. And this is saying it's important that we make the distinction. It's a, it's a light that helps us understand God's word. And we have to guard against mixing those with one another or making the gospel into a law. And if we do that, we're going to obscure, we're going to cloud the gospel of Christ, and troubled consciences won't have any comfort. The Reformation has to be done in every century. The Reformation uh, continues in every day. The church is always being reformed by this teaching. And you see how important it is. Now, I'm coming to the, the end of uh, our the hour that I try to adhere to. You know, I'm not going to get penalized by anybody or anything if I go an hour and five minutes. But as I often said, the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a good place to start. I, I print this out ahead of time. 
so that I can tell well, where are we in this. We've covered a lot of ground today, and I really haven't given you any t time at all to ask questions. Let me, let me give you that time that's remaining here. Do you have any questions or concerns or anything bothering you about what we've covered today? Hey, Pastor Larson, I, um, I just wanted to say uh, it was a great, great lesson today. I, uh, it was very informative. Um, but uh, sad, my mom is actually real, really nagging me um, to uh, get in the car already. Okay. Um, I got to go play 18 today. So um, I got I got to run, sadly. All right. No, that's not sad that you're getting time on the links. I wish I could join you, and uh, and you are excused. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Have yes. a great weekend, Ian. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Who is it? Who's that? That's a, a, a young man of about, uh, let's see, 14? 13, 14. Yeah, and he's, he's a student of the Bible, and he wants to learn more. He just, he just graduated from Trinity, too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's going into high school. Good. Let's see. Where are we? We're in the summer. He's going into high school this fall. Sometimes I forget what time of the year it is. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Your questions, please. I have one question I wanted to ask you um, on uh, Luther's uh, explanation of um, how God offers forgiveness of sins. In Galatians 3.13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Um, okay. For it is, it, it is written, everyone who is hung on, a curse it is everyone who is hung on a tree. So is he saying that Christ was cursed because he was hung on a tree? You'll go back to the Old Testament. Genesis, doesn't that take us back to Genesis? Um, Galatians 3, what was it? Uh, 13. Okay, I put that on the screen. Yeah. So that we can all look at it together. Okay. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Yeah. Because was he was hung on a tree. Yeah. I'm thinking it's the curse of Adam and Eve. Is, it, is that what they're referring to? It's a little bit later. Later, okay. No, he's explaining um, how how uh, how the gospel offers forgiveness, how Christ offers forgiveness. Is it because he offered himself? But where's the curse come in? On our <laughs> We're going to get that. See, I, I use helps. I use these kind of helps just like you do. And okay, so do you see that, uh, you know, this computer uh, Bible is just a very big help. I use BibleGateway.com and I use BibleHub.com. Right now, I'm in BibleGateway.com, as you can see at the top. And here is the quote, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So you see footnote B and footnote, footnote B, it says cited from Deuteronomy 21, 21 23. And I have it. All right. And we're going to get it too. Go ahead and read it, Judy. Let's see. Uh, okay. I'm going to send here. 21, 23. You, uh, I'm going to go back a little ways. If a man... I'm going to start with 22. If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Okay. So this application of one of Moses' laws has been brought into the New Testament by St. Paul, who knew the Old Testament, and he had this quote. Now, there's also a cross-reference uh, to the tree because Jesus was hung on the tree of the cross. 
Now you understand tree is not a literal thing uh, growing in the meadow. This is a piece of wood which is fastened from a tree. Mm -hmm. Right. Now it didn't look like the it didn't look like the lumber over at Lowe's. Neatly planed and cut into rectangles. Right? It was a a rough piece of, of a tree. It didn't go through a lot of trouble to make it look like the crosses that are on our churches and that we wear around our necks or yeah, other places. You understand the cross was an ugly thing. It was a, an instrument of death. But okay. Christ became a curse for us. He took the curse of the law. That's the curse. The curse of the law against that person in the Old Testament was that he was a murderer and he was hung on a tree as his punishment. He was killed. Okay. So long he, before there was a crucifixion. All right. That's an interesting thing. Does that answer your question, Evelyn? So the the people who were hung on that tree were cursed. And Christ redeemed them by hanging himself on a tree. He became a curse for all. He became now, a curse to yeah. redeem us. When the witnesses to that death, uh, the, the wages of sin is death and the wages of the sin of murder is, is literal death. Mm -hmm. All right, that's still true. Well, the, because anyone who looked at the person hanging, they would say that person is a curse by God because he took the life of another person. I know the word human being is used today. I don't know why. Well. When they looked at Christ on the cross, the witnesses would say he must really be guilty of something awful. Uh -huh. he, and he actually was guilty of nothing, yeah. except he was becoming, he looked like a curse for us. He was the escape coach. Yeah. Well, uh, since we're out of time, I'm going to end the, uh, the session that goes up on YouTube and uh, with this prayer. God, our Father, thank you for revealing to us the law and the gospel. Thank you for distinguishing the two so that we might apply these to our lives and to the lives of others that we care about. And help us always to see Christ for us. Christ's love for us in giving himself as a sacrifice acceptable to you, Father, that we might have and do have forgiveness of sins and life and salvation and all the gifts of the Spirit, simply because you chose us in Christ and because you love us even today. Help us then to repent of our sin daily and to come to you with faithful and believing hearts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.